Hello and welcome to the first episode of what we're now calling the Tom and Joe show, apparently. Yes. Um, joining me down a line of Discord is Joe from the United States. Joe, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Joe Stratman, um, former intern for Anime Insider Magazine, former film critic, former lots of things. Um, recently, I was former uh, writer for the anime blog Infinite Rainy Day, which is where I met uh, Tom over here, or as we know it, Tom. Hi. <laughs> so, hi. So, um, we did podcasts on it. It's called Heavy... Storms, heavy storms, which, yeah. Where we, yep, heavy storms. Where we do ter terrible anime or like the interesting ones, and we did one on uh, End of Evangelion, which falls on the inter interesting side and not mm -hmm. bad. And so we just had a nice long discussion on that, interrupted by a skit I tried to, you know, shove in and it didn't work and I shouldn't have done it. But we'll never uh, speak of again. Yeah, but if you search <laughs> Heavy Storms at Evangelion, you can see our podcast on that. So we had a nice discussion on that, and so we figured we might as well have more nice discussions on stuff. So we're going to have uh, discussions on anime, music, and other stuff maybe down the road. But um, it's just going to be about what we're talking about, and we're not going to like dive into you know what we're watching. We're just going to talk about this. In this case, um, we're talking about the... Revolutionary Girl Utena movie, The Adolescence of Utena. Yep. Also known in uh, multiple regions as just Revolutionary U Girl Utena, the movie. Um, so, this, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Tom. I am, as you can probably tell, obnoxiously British. Um, and uh, basically, as, as Joe said, we, we met on a site called uh, Infinite Rainy Day. Uh, you might hear eventually when we when we get round to having such things as guests on uh, this 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 podcast. You may hear from some familiar, well, some familiar voices. You won't hear from familiar faces because we do not have the budget to sort of fly ourselves out to the United States and back again. Um, a little bit of background about myself: I am a current film critic. I do a web comic. I do music, and now I do this. So, yes, let's talk about Revolutionary Girl Utena, Adolescence of Utena, or as we're now going to call it, the, the most surreal, insane film I have seen this decade. Which, I know we're only in February, but... <laughs> this decade, bloody hell. Right? Bloody hell. Even though, even though it was released in 1999, and yes. uh, uh, it was produced by Sega, who, if I, I'm thinking right... They also produced End of Evangelion, so they have the most yep. two of the most surreal movies uh, in anime in of the turn of the century. Yep. If uh, you bought a Dreamcast, this is where your money went. Probably. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so, um, some not dubbing Sonic correctly. <clears throat> So, a little bit of background about this movie and how it came to be. So, Revolutionary Girl Utena is a, I believe it's 97, is it? 1997 um, anime series um, yes. of about 36 episodes. Um, direct, well, sort of partially directed. The group call themselves, um, let me, it's B, is it B Group, isn't it? And the B Group is sort of formed of, sort of, it's almost like a collective a la the other sort of manga car group clamp, but it's sort of head, headed by um, the gentleman we're going to talk a lot about today, um, Kuniko Ikuhara. Um, yes. A little bit of background on Ikuhara. Ikuhara is a not only a sort of a reasonably well-known figure in terms of um, anime production, um, he sort of how would how would one how would you describe Ikuhara to the to the unenlightened Joe? Um, he is a very artist's uh, he is, yeah. kind of <laughs> manga and anime maker. Yeah. Um, yeah. it is very symbolic. Very, um, there's a lot of allegory going on. There's a lot of meaning going on under the. Uh, images mm. and there is a lot of um 
we'll get into this later, but there's yeah. a lot of motif, there's a lot of, uh, as I already said, symbolism, and mm. it's, it's all, everything means something else, yeah. or it is very, is all unique and done artistically. Mm. Whereas I think he obviously, I mean, the obviously he, he is not only close, I mean, he's fairly close personal friends with Hideki Anno, who sort of, I suppose, is sort of almost the flip side of the Ikuhara approach, which is, here is some symbolism, we're using symbolism because it's symbolic of something, but it's sort of, it, it, it's set dressing, whereas Ikuhara's symbolism is, no, this is actually what I intend you to read into the work. So a little bit of background on Ikuhara. Ikuhara um, started probably, to, in terms of a Western audience aside from Utena, he is probably most famous for being the sort of the director of the third and fourth seasons of Sailor Moon, uh, wherein obviously we are introduced to uh, Neptune and Uranus and the, the whole, the, the sort of he is he is a director i think where the, he sort of his key theme seems to be love and sort of obviously alongside the sims of symbolism he's sort of he, compared to a lot of anime directors he is very much sort of interested in, in relationships and how relationships form and sort of coalesce and obviously sailor moon introduces the two characters of uranus and neptune who are you know not subtextually but actually convert uh, sort of in throughout the entire work as uh, sort of obviously are in a relationship with each other and i think that's sort of something yeah. that sorry um, you were saying yeah it yeah i was just um what he really pushed was uh, sexuality like mm. uranus and neptune were both women and it was the big lesbian uh awakening for a lot of women i know um yeah they weren't cousins yeah. they, they, were, they were never cousins <laughs> like the american or... versions or close no, friends as uh, I think Viz what was it Viz recently said oh they are very very close friends and everyone went we had this 20 no. years ago no <laughs> stop it <laughs> absolutely not uh, but also there's Yuri Kuma which is uh, you know Yuri Bears um, and then we have Sar Sarazanme which is the uh, Kappas which do a lot of uh, I this it sounds immature, but it's Kappas who do butt stuff. But it's yep. <laughs> that's kind of what the series boils down to. Yeah. Uh, and then you have Penguin it, Drum, which is sort of Penguin Drum. I think I feel is like the, the sort of is actually the series I first watched of Ikuhara's, and it almost encapsulate encapsulates. I think this is obviously Ikuhara on a, on a much looser leash. Um, obviously. In his more recent work than he was in Newton or obviously in Sailor Moon, but obviously with with Penguin Drum, I felt Penguin Drum was sort of like almost the everyone is sort of in a relationship with everyone else, um, and it is sort of you know peak Ikuhara aesthetic. I mean everything okay. is peak Ikuhara aesthetic, but sort of the, the Penguin Drum almost felt like a a coalescing of that into sort of, you know, one single work. Okay. Um, Penguin Drum's kind of my blind spot here. Mm. Um, I did watch Utena. I have watched Yuri Kuma. I've watched a couple episodes of Saren Sanme. Mm. Um, I, it wasn't for me. We'll get into mm. some things about Ikuhara. Um, I don't yeah. like later. It's, it's, uh, um, the thing is I come from a writing background and Ikuhara clearly comes from an artistic background, and sometimes those things clash. And but we'll get more into that when we talk the movie and yeah. like the differences between the series and the movie. Yeah. Right. So um, let's talk. So in essence, this is a. It's not quite. It's, it's sort of a. I, I, it's a strange. We go back to Anno because obviously this is almost like rebuild is to Evangelion. Uh, it, this film is obviously to Utena. It's sort of a coalescing of those sort of the key themes of the work down into a cinematic format. But I feel where sort of um, Evangelion's sort of rebuild series is very much sort of a reinterpretation and improvement of Evangelion for sort of a 20th, 21st century audience. This is altogether a, mo a more 
bizarre beast. Um, yes. It's, uh, it's a little hard to explain explain the difference between the series and the movie. Obviously, the movie is a shorter version, and it is technically a retelling of the series, but it is in no way wants to do the same thing the series is doing. Um, the original revolutionary girl, Utena, uh, which the plot is about this um, girl who wants to be a prince named Utena, who uh, fights, who gets this ring at her high school and becomes a duelist who challenges for the princess, Anthe, and then she duels all the people to become Anthe's prince, and there's a lot more going on underneath as it goes later, because it starts the first with the, uh, you know, typical setup, uh, yeah. where you just duel all these and you win the princess, and then the second, it re- kind of thinks it. It does it again, but it rethinks it to where these are more like people who are trying to react and um, absorb what's going on and be manipulated and something like that. So it's the, and then the third is just like letting everything loose of what's really going on underneath everything, which is, you know, gender roles and you know, uh, the patriarchy and how fiction works and stuff like that. Yeah. So what the movie does is it boils it down to the story of a girl. <laughs> so, um, and this is very specifically about her and the world her around her. And um, it is very stylized, very surreal. It is... I don't think anything on the surface is meant to be taken literally. It is an artistic rendition of this girl and the world around her and the people around her. Yeah, I, 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 I having never actually, this is, this is my confession, I've never actually seen the original Utena, but it's sort of, I don't think you could, you could really go from this from the original series to this and go yes this is absolutely the same but I think it almost helped in my in my case not to have seen the original series I mean in other, in other, of other ways obviously it hamstrings my interpretation of things but sort of I mm -hmm. I almost feel this is sort of like you know you're not you're gonna get as much out of this if you've not seen the original series and therefore are not sort of weighed down with the baggage of the series and how it, how it approaches certain concepts as as obviously you would be if you uh, but if you didn't if you had seen the series I mean it's sort of it's a bit of it's a bit of sort of six of half half a dozen of the other and it's sort of it's interesting to see a a a a, a creator sort of look at his work and sort of come back and sort of do it revise so close to obviously the original series and take such a different interpretation of it. Yeah, it's um, interesting just to see how it can be changed to this uh, big reinterpreting of, you know, magical girl of hero shows of, you know, all these typical prince goes and saves the princess and all of this stuff. Um, but then come back and say, no, it's actually the story of this person who has had a really screwed up life and has had like slowly puts together who they are and um, who they love and what they want to do. And that's mainly what the movie is about. Uh, it's, um, you do miss out on some things. Like there is a uh, little joke breather in the middle uh, where you meet Naname, who is uh, a vital character in the anime, but um, she is played for a skit which you will totally not understand if you haven't seen the series. Um, she is very spoiled rich girl, and uh, Ikuhara does a lot of commentary on fashion and brand names. Like, she gets a... Uh, in this one, Nanami is just a skit where she is a cow, and she has her, like hanger on boys who are all like all trying to be her bo boyfriend and they're 
elephants. And this is an entirely different part of the series where it was about how she gets a Dior cowbell because it's Dior, it's fashionable, and it slowly turns her into a cow, and that's a big fashion thing. So, but in here, there is no explanation of who she is, why she's here, why she's a cow, so, and why there are two mascot characters, because the two mascot characters played a much bigger part in the television series, but they just show up occasionally in the background, in skit, like in the skit or a couple places elsewhere. So there are a few things you need, and I think Mickey and Jury kind of, uh, as characters, get into... Uh, kind of get the short end because they have to tell this all this other story that's um, kind of more important to Utena's story mm -hmm. but um, anyway it feels like we should probably actually tell you what the plot of this is so a boy isn't that sort of a, a sort of, is a boy isn't that a job um, right <laughs> yes yes yeah, the story of, 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 of adolescence of Utena well uh, uh, I think you think we should we should, we should have taken this in turns because um, there is a lot. I, I can of... take this. Yeah, I can take this. Okay, so we start with uh, Utena, who is this very boyish um, girl who uh, she goes to her new high school, um, and it's a little bit muddled why she is going there, but um, it seems like she wants to be closer to this uh, guy named Toga, who is. Uh, was very important to her uh, and, but we find out more about that later but she she goes there and it's this very super stylized high school there's like all of the stairs are rotating like it's the Harry Potter hallways and it's uh, there's you know large spaces where people can just overlook everything and <laughs> pardon me uh, dry air, it's like but, it's um, like M C S has designed the entire place. It, it's 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 a, yeah. It's where the visual interestingness begins and sort of almost epitomizes the the lot of the visual stuff in this in this film. Yeah, it's very surreal, very stylized. It is not like any place. You're not going to think like, oh, how does this architecture work? Because it doesn't matter. It's very stylized, and eventually she finds her way to a rose garden where she meets Anthe. And Anthe is um, the headmaster's sister. Um, and she is also secretly the uh, oh, I keep forgetting what they call her, but she is essentially the princess who is the prize. And the secret is um. Rose Maiden? Is it something like Rose Maiden? I'm pretty yeah, sure. The, yeah, Rose Maiden, sir. But, um... So... She... Gets this ring. I think she got it from Toga. It's mm -hmm. Some of it's yeah. not clear because of what we learn later, but a, a lot of this is also not actually... may not actually be happening, but... Yeah. Which also adds a layer onto things. So, she is the Rose Bride. So... Anthe is the Rose Bride, so everybody duels to have the Rose Bride. And um, she just happens to walk into it not knowing uh, what it, it she is. And then she runs into Keochi. I, I am sometimes very terrible, but he's a greener guy who is the current prince. And he is a very abusive shit. Um and they have a duel where uh, Utena does not know that she's in a duel but she picks up a bamboo stick and tries to battle him when he has a sword um, so that doesn't work out but um, Anthe like, has a sword within her that she allows Utena to use and Utena wins and becomes the prince <laughs> so it is here's where the anime becomes about all of the dueling like there are all of these people like you will meet Mickey who is a very girlish boy and uh, Jury who is a 
student council representative and she is the head of the fencing club and she is very uh, in charge and these characters they exist in this series but they don't play a part as does uh, Wakaba who is uh, Utena's friend she instantly meets like she instantly meets Wakaba in the movie and then Wakaba kind of disappears to the background so yeah. um this is where the movie kind of splits where from the series where the series becomes more about the dueling then eventually it disassembles the tropes of this genre but um here it is about utena and anthe who are coming out of different relationships and different paths like um to spoil a little bit um uh utena was very close with toga this boy she came to the school at the bidding of or you, it's she following her. Very, she's she said she was following toga to this school so um but toga is not there anymore and um but he is still there like there will there are people who will talk to him or there are people who he will talk to but there's nobody else there and we'll get into that later yeah. so um so utena is this boyish loner girl who wa following in toga's footsteps to be a prince and then and she's trying to figure out what that is and on the other hand, there's Anthe, who is this headmaster's sister, who is very, there's like this air of nobility. Like she is noble and she is high status. So everybody wants to fight for her. And ev she is kind of a trophy and she kind of treats herself as such as like when uh, Utena goes back to her dorm and then she gets a knock on the door and then Utena is just uh, is shocked to find that Anthe just throws herself on her and she doesn't know what to do with this. So they have a conversation and they just talk and she kind of has to toss her out because, whoa, 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 you, you don't just throw yourself at anybody who just because they're something. And so it is about them developing the relationship and the relationship about of everybody around her that built her life. So sorry, I've been talking a lot. No, that's that's fine. I mean, it, it's sort of very interesting. I I, I think from sort of a, a vision, not only a visual story, but how much of this film is sort of is, is visual rather than narrative storytelling. As you said, Ikuhara is a sort of a an animator who and a, a sort of a creator who sort of I I feel not so much that words are sort of secondary to his thing, but he often sort of there are there are large sections of this film where he, he lets imagery speak for it. You know, you don't need dialogue when you can just... You know, the, the old cinematic rule, show, don't tell. And I, and I think Ikihara's approach to that is, is interesting. But it's it's also almost with a, with a lot of this film, like it has, you know, he has literally pared down and, and sort of basically cut as much as he can of the thing. And, and in a lot of sections of the film, it's actually quite minimalist. Um, in the in the approach, you know, he sort of he, if he's got one scene to sort of develop a character, he'll use it. He doesn't feel the need to sort of you know have three or four scenes w with the character with with each character, as I feel obviously a, a sort of an a, and his approach in the anime is. Mm -hmm. um, and the big thing where I really really love the movie um, Ikuhara's series, um, it takes a little bit for me to get into them because. He uses motifs and visual stuff way too much, where it's so many repeating images. Like um, in Utena, the every time she has to duel, she has to go up the elevator, and then there's the spiral staircase, and then they have to do the song, um, which is supposed to be making fun of performance pieces, and or making fun of this or that like in the duel in the movie it's making it's 
poking at people who want to live in the Middle Ages. Like, that's what all of the lyrics are about. They're kind of nonsense, they're kind of not. Uh, but that happens a whole bunch more times in the series. Um, and the repetition uh, kind of grates at me because uh, I come from a writing background where they say trust your audience and don't beat them over the head where artists are like, I have to mo have a motif. I have to like wrap everything around uh, and make sure people know this is a motif or this is a, this is a point I am making. And they cut our artistic you tend to, you know, hit your audience over the head and that, that kind of clashes, but with the movie, they, there's not enough time for it to repeat itself too much. They only do um, the dueling thing once they only do... Uh, there's a song that comes later that is very big in the series, that, and they only do it once. So it keeps the repetition down, yeah. and it boils the everything down to what I like about Ikuhara, who is extremely interesting in how he can tell a story but he doesn't but how he tells it is extremely interesting because it's not just directly at you it is using imagery to um I hate imagery it. i think yeah i think his use of imagery is sort of he almost uses it to sort of go you know Okay, there's like the the imagery of the roses and the sort of thing, but you know, okay, now audience, I know that you're relatively smart. Here is here is like this is more clearly like a metaphor for something, and and I feel that sort of uh, I feel that works a lot better in sort of um what this film than what I've seen of the rest of Ikuhara's stuff, where he does sort of go, have you got it yet? 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 And it's sort of and I feel that sort of basically this film pairs down his symbolism to two main, well, two or three main sort of approaches. Obviously, the roses being, you know, a key symbol, not only sort of, I mean, for example, each character has a different coloured rose on the front of their uniform, and it's okay, you know, oh, Ikuhara is obviously sort of talking about the language of flowers because Utsu is wearing a white one and obviously okay there's a symbolism of purity and other characters wearing a yellow one and it's sort of it, you, you can obviously go okay there is something more going on than just oh, oh it's a rose yeah and then there's stuff that well like um, when we get into Toga's backstory uh, Toga was a uh, child who was trafficked to a rich family and his father um, did some sexual acts on him. He was raped and they uh, use a narrative where one of the characters that Toga is talking to turns into a butterfly and or you know something like that and hmm. the it just su she suddenly turns to a butterfly and the butterflies are suddenly all flying around her flying away from him as the act is happening like his in innocence is being taken away hmm. and uh, certain other things because I think the, the butterfly is Shiori who is um, uh, a bit of a character who is in between Utena and Toga they don't explain it outright what she is, but she was a person who was very interested in being romantically involved with Toga, but um, he was more interested in Utena, so uh, she has this reaction towards uh, Utena that she does not like him at all, and she does not like various things, and she's kind of a stand-in for um, like some sort of corruption of society, weirdly enough, because she is the person who kind of toes the line of society, even though there's these things about her that she wants to keep secret, and she keeps them secret, but, and she chooses to side with um, the machinations of society, and to mm. so, there's so, she, her turning into a butterfly, like and then she, her being all the butterflies of his innocence flying away is kind of like him becoming a cog in the machine of this society stuff, which is, this is all 
very interesting ways of telling the story. Mm, yeah, because I feel this is like with with Ikuhara's approach in this film. There is obviously the other key thing I think it is. It is far more overt, and obviously, given this is you know a a film as opposed to a series where you have to sort of. Uh, approach certain sensibilities, shall we say, because obviously this was going out on, you know, Japanese television and you cannot be sort of very, you you know, you've got to be very careful about how you depict certain things. I'm not saying obviously the Nuda was eaten, uh, was was lesser for that, but the, I feel his symbolism was put into, you know, service sort of d showing stuff in a way that sort of did not need to actually be, you know, the overtly shown, if that makes sense. Whereas in whereas in the film, it's obviously like okay, now we can do such things as you know more overtly talk about Utena's and Anthony's relationship and sort of how they grow as characters and obviously the I won't even say subtext because it's just text in this film the the, the text of their relationship um, and particularly since Ikuhara's works have always sort of approached same-sex relationships with a with a I would say with a degree more maturity than sort of a lot of the market sort of he the market a lot of his con contemporaries have um, and I feel this is the film that sort of encapsulates that approach best because uh, I feel we'll come on to sort of speak about this later but this is a very gay film <laughs> oh yes very oh very yes gay. like the text of it is it feels weird talking about the text because it almost sounds like a normal movie when you just talk about what it's about because it's just um, Utena is this girl who is whose boyfriend has gone up and she's following him and she wants to be just like him so and she meets this girl named Anthe she can be a prince too and but then they realize they have to actually be people and they actually have to learn to love each other and accept each other which is a very challenging thing because she is very uh Utena was very sexually sheltered and Anthe was is kind of a trophy of the patriarchy and this rich family so um she is very I I don't want to it's very rude to say loose but it's just like she it is a part of her yeah. society that she is expected to be this um, so, and then there's the relationships around her. Like there is Shiori who is, uh, she had a huge crush on Toga and hates Utena and, um, <coughs> and who actually, it's rumored that, uh, Jury, who is the student council president and all that, she has a locket with Shiori in it and um she cannot accept that and she cannot accept a lot of things and she's just trying to sabotage everything um for not only the bounds of society but because she didn't get what she wanted and then there's utena coming to grips with toga and then there's uh a whole bit about society which is uh but all of this is going on with everything else in the foreground with really bizarre things like uh, they'll there's a giant rose uh, garden on this rooftop that Anthe um, tends which is very suggestive and uh, symbol symbolic so uh, that just exists and it, it just exists on this block up there and then there's the dueling, which is uh, how they, I guess they symbolize like high school conflicts, like how Shiori is very manipulative and tries to uh, use her, that jury might have a crush on her to fight Utena mm. and stuff like that. But it comes off as a, you know, sword duel where yeah yeah it's, uh, it's very... and i feel the, the approach of this is sort of how much on the you know compared to a lot of anime where sort of you know okay what you see is is actually what is happening this is almost like you know i would almost compare it to sort of you know other experimental and surrealist 
sort of cinema is in the case well what are you actually looking at is this truly you know a are they actually fighting each other with swords um on a on on sort of this this rose garden that just seems to be perched in midair um or is this sort of is this symbolizing something else and it's sort of it's very interesting to sort of go considering sort of various things that happen towards the denouement of this film is sort of how much of this is actually real Yes, um, and also there is this layer of artifice above it. Like, um, I there's a huge difference between the subs and the dubs. Like the uh, subtitle voice acting is very deliberately artificial. There is a this huge layer. Like the um, there's a Greek choir of girls who work for the reporting club, and. Um, their performances in the sub are very artificial. It's like yeah. extra, extra. Read all about it. Yeah, and and almost stu- almost and, Seussian and, in places, if I remember correctly, because it's almost like, uh, and it's almost like okay, you know, sort of at what point is this forming? Because you know, sort of some attic chorus is this actually, you know, theatrical a theatrical approach, or are these girls actually like this? <laughs> yes, um, but in the dub, it is more naturalistic where they mm-hmm. talk like they're actually on a radio show and not just pretending to be like re- in the reporting club like mm-hmm. every uh, anime uh, I shouldn't say an- every anime but like a good amount of them have reporting yeah. club who is sole purpose is to spout out uh, exposition about what is going on and they, ki- they kind of play with it and they kind of make note that it is very artificial mm-hmm. but the Voice acting in the dub is very naturalistic, so that layer kind of gets lost. But um, I think there is a strength in the dub when it gets into the like actual intimate scenes between Utena and Anthe and stuff like that, because it feels um, more. Because obviously they're going more naturalistic, so it sounds more real, like they're actually having an intimate conversation between each other, and there's not this layer of artifice that where yeah, I'd it's say this. Very, Oh, sorry. It's uh, very much feels like it's trying to be a play, or it's a very uh, stylized, you know, surrealistic version of something that is actually happening. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's interesting. I I feel it is a it is a good dub, but the sort of the sub and the dub sort of are perhaps the sort of slightly cross purposes with each other, you know. The dub, the dub, the dub is actually fairly good for sort of you know late nineties. Um, I can't particularly have any complaint about any of the characters, as you said. The sort of the English dub of um, particularly Uta and Anthe is, is very very good, but I I feel like sort of the the sub version, the Japanese version, perhaps sort of gets that sort of almost and and I'm almost sort of going to compare it to sort of someone I think Ukihara gets compared to sort of a number of times which is obviously David Lynch it it sort of has that Lynchian sort of unreality to it you know sort of you know is it's it's particularly sort of with the reporting club perhaps perhaps with sort of some of the other scenes there's a very Visually impressive sort of scene at about, about sort of the halfway time where you sort of see Utena and Anthe sort of spend time with each other alone on the rose garden, and you get this sort of beautifully weird, and it's almost sort of something like out of a forties sort of you know big big production musical, where sort of the two of them dance sort of in, uh, essentially a water covered platform, and obviously you got the stars and reflected in it, and it sort of it is like something out of David Lynch. Yeah, and there is that artifice in David Lynch, mm. like in uh, Blue Velvet, there's mm. the uh, suburban where it plays like a 1950s sitcom, but there's this extremely dark stuff going on under it. So there, there is that artifice, <coughs> pardon me, uh, artifice that is there, but that's hiding what's actually really going on mm. underneath. And it's, um, I think here it is about... Like how there is this kind of fake life going on, how, like how in our normal existence, but there is this real 
personal relationships that are going on underneath that are really what's driving it and um, we, we will get there in the spoiler but there it is very much about society and is very much about um, overcoming it to find your own happiness to find your own life and um, yeah. Ikuhara at least in that part it is much more optimistic or has the belief that it can be overcome uh, more than uh, Lynch does which is why it is Utena is so beloved between a lot of them because it gives people the confidence to you know find their own happiness which um, there are a lot of people who it's their favorite show uh, I know four or five people who it Utena is the favorite show and um, it's n it's not quite mine it didn't hit me as much I mean there there are things that will hit you at a deeper level and obviously I am not the as a straight male I am not the person who this is supposed to be for me and that is okay it is does what it does and it is beloved by the people who found who found it and needed to find it and that's fine so um yeah I think we yeah, need to there's just what's up Shall we talk about the queer subtext or the text? Because it is like this. This is oh, this absolutely. is very gay. This is very gay. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the sort of basically the, compared to the sort of the TV version and sort of perhaps perhaps to compared to a sort of almost every anime, this is very very sort of overt in its sort of depiction of um female female sort of relationships and I feel that sort of there is a very mature approach to it there is a very you know I, I hesitate to sort of think of a work prior to sort of something like Yuri on Ice which obviously had a you know a 12 a, 12, a sort of 11 12 episode run to play with that it is this it, that is as much as this film is sort of as positive because it is a very positive film when it comes to that sort of to sort of fit to sort of female lesbian relationships sort of and it's remarkable it's remarkable to think this sort of this surreal sort of film from sort of 1999 is still probably one of if not the sort of work that sort of epitomizes that because it is very much and it's not again it's not a subtext i feel it is it is text in this film the sort of you know there is there is a sense of sort of escaping the, an oppressive society which sort of obviously regards um and, and sort of japan i feel still is a country that does struggle with sort of you know dealing with sort of concepts such as obviously lgbt relationships it has improved obviously since this film was made but it's still sort of not not quite as comparable as it is to sort of you know sections of europe and, and areas of the united states and it is very much a film about sort of you know being in love with other with sort of you know another another girl or, or frankly I feel the subtext sort of works as well sort of toward general sort of queer relationships um, and it's about sort of you know you don't have to sort of stick to, to sort of make do with sort of what society gives you and I feel that sort of that scene in sort of their past relationship you can make this sort of almost this whole new world w with someone you love. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest part of it is that these two characters are not any ideal, but they are messy people coming mm. in and they are, they have to figure some shit about themselves <laughs> and about each other. Um, because once they first meet each other, they're not exactly entranced, like, Utena is like weirded out by she's j her auntie just throwing herself and eventually they reveal a, you know themselves to each other which is shown in a very very suggestive painting sequence um, where they kind of draw each other and they learn about each other and they learn to love each other even though they are very messy people who come from very messy backgrounds and it is in this way that this super stylized, super fairy tale show um, kind of gets a more realistic vision of people than, um, you know, shows that are about these people are. 
Hmm. I mean, de I mean, definitely. And I feel that is something that sort of you don't see in sort of a lot of or sort of that isn't played for you know obviously particularly in sort of things like Yowie and Yuri, where it isn't just played for sort of pure drama. But you know that sort of the relationship is messy and sort of nothing is quite perfect. But sort of the, you, if you have each other, that you can make you can make it work. And and I feel that sort of Utena captures that sort of you know. Particularly in sort of a terms of sort of you know obviously coming to terms with one's own sexuality as sort of as a teenager as the obviously the characters are in this sort of film it's sort of beautifully done and sort of you know and and I feel it sort of it, it obviously does resonate with sort of as as actually a lot of Ikuhara's work does with sort of a a queer audience. Uh, I'm not saying that it is it is you know just for that audience, but the approach sort of. His his approach is is very inclusive, and, and and it sort of it can be seen obviously in the original series itself with obviously some male male relationships, but obviously with with this broader canvas and sort of this this tighter approach upon Utena and Anthony, you do get it sort of as a, a much stronger in this work compared to sort of obviously the TV version. Yeah, um, the series is much more about the giant machine that hovers over him. It's like the patriarchy and mm. society, and it's everything else. And it's um, they're very uh, more. There's much more uh, development with Akio, who is um, Anthe's brother, and there's he is much more of an active villain than he is in the movie, uh, which we'll get to in. Uh, when, once we get to the designated spoiler section, but there is a very they um, develop the machine much more, and in this one um, they don't really need to because once they get to the stories, it just like you kind of get it. You get why these people are messed up the way they are, and it's. And since you've already watched the series, you already get what all the symbolism is. Like, there's a giant uh, palace in the background that is much more elaborated on in the series. But you, at the end, you kind of get what it means. And you don't need this, you know, extra development. So it can just be about mm. the people. And that's what I really loved about this movie is that it is really... I, I am much more about characters than, like, the, these finer points of a series so when um, it gets to this point where it's like yeah these are actual people talking um, it's really nice and it's especially when it gets a series like this which is super uh, it's supposed to be this fairy tale of a place uh, um, and it's super stylized and there's all the symbolism going on so when you can do that that's really quite an accomplishment hmm. are you ready for designated spoilers oh we're about 15 minutes in so I'd say we're good for it so Utena turns into a car it's a mistake to think you're the only one who can turn into a car I'm a car now, too. So, after all of this, we get into why these characters are so messy. And we find out Toga has been dead the whole time. So, um, it it's a thing that goes back to the beginning where um, why Shiori is the way she is and why Utena. So, uh, Toga was going to declare his love for Utena and the moment he did that there was a drowning girl in a in a lake that he goes save but by saving her he himself drowns and then there's Shiori who wanted to be Toga's love but did not get that and um, he died so uh, she blames Utena and does everything she can to destroy Utena's life and, which includes when she gets into this relationship with Anthe. And Anthe, on the other end, is this headmaster's sister who comes from a very rich, important family. And then um, it is 
her brother, who is a massive playboy, um, drugged her and raped her. And then at the moment that, uh, at the end of it, uh, she reali he realized Anthony was awake for a part of it or all of it. And then um, he, they, he, for, it implies he kills himself because he realized she wasn't, she was awake for all this and can't deal with it. I think they, there's some subtext that maybe Anthony killed her, killed him, but um, I'm not 100% sure from what it, the sh movie shows me is that um, he realized what he was doing and realized he was, what he was doing with his sister who was awake and then couldn't deal with it and killed himself. And that literally left a hole in her heart in the show and um, so that's what happened to her. And then she, since she became the sole inheritor of all of this, then she became the trophy for all of these rich people. And that is what's happened on their end. So when they figure this out, um, this is when they're like, okay, we love each other. We want to go for our own happiness. We're going to go for it. We're going to go outside of these bounds. We're going to go outside of this shit that we, that has pinned us down. And we are going to go out that and find our own happiness, even though there's not a highway there. There's no pathways. And so they literally do that by Utena turning into a car. And um, Anthe is her driver. And Anthe is trying to drive drive her on the course that is outside of all of these bounds of society. But Shiori is not happy about this. So Shiori turns into a car and chases them. But um, the really smart part of this was like Shiori gets stopped immediately, but that doesn't stop the people like Shiori from coming. So there are other cars and there are hundreds of them and they each drag her down and they kind of try to destroy this relationship and that's I think that was a really smart part where just because there's this one person who's defeated doesn't mean there's these other people who are going to mm. s try to stop them and then there's this and then eventually they dr go by the castle which is um, tries to crush them and it is driven and there's a vision of Akio Anthe's brother at the end of it that is like trying to stop her so it's the symbolism for this patriarchy for the society and then they drive through it and they make it through through it together and that's kind of where the movie goes and <laughs> sorry so um it really sounds nice when I I can actually talk spoilers and it, it all comes together because this it, it is actually really well done, even though it is like gif worthy, it's meme worthy, like, you know, yeah. it is foolish to think you are the only person who can talk to it, but it's, <laughs> it, it is really weird and wild that there is this race, quote unquote, where even like the Greek choir says, but there's only one car. How can it be a race? And they're like, shut up. Uh, but then... And it's all of this silly, over-the-top stuff, but it also gets this, you know, resonance that you don't really get when it's, if what's on screen is literally about what it's supposed to be, which obviously it's not because it is a woman being transformed into a car, another woman driving her, <laughs> and... Uh, being chased by a, another woman who turns into a car and other people who turn into cars and chase after them and where and they eventually try to get smashed by a castle that has uh, treads that eventually it turns looks like sideways. Like a Mad Max. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is this it big is. finale and it's uh, it is very weird in a way because I always forget what happens in the last like two minutes when they leave the highway because there's just like so much going on and then it's like after this it's like they kind of like oh this is our path and and now we have to go our own way and su such and such and it's like 
it's like, oh, I don't remember this conversation happening because there was so much crazy shit. Yeah, it's, I, I feel like it's, 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 you know, we could talk about the spoilers from this, and I, and I still think you need to go and see this film, and, and that sort of weird. Talking about the spoilers doesn't really matter for this film, because it is just, it, it's an experience, isn't it? It's just like... I, I yeah. feel this is like this is a film that honestly would deserve like a road show re redone perhaps for the sort of the twenty fifth anniversary because this needs to be seen on a big screen. Yeah, <laughs> it is. They very much realize it is a movie and like deliver very big scenes that um, blow up the intimate uh, feelings of the of the characters to mm -hmm. full war, you know, melodrama. I'm Oh not yeah, that the is, series is... didn't. It was <laughs> the series had plenty of symbolism and very much blew up the relationships to really weird things. Like Akio's car was uh very much more of a character than um it is in the movie. Um although what I do <laughs> like is that um, after the things with Anthony and uh, Akio happen, he's like, where's the keys? Where's the keys? Because uh, hmm. he's looking for the keys to his cars so and he can't find it. And then it's something... Uh, then they actually come back to it where um, Anthony is like, oh, I have this beautiful car now, but I don't have the key. But she does have the keys. She, And it's meant to imply... Um, Akio was messed up because she he took Anthony's heart without having the key to it mm -hmm. um, putting aside the brother sister stuff but um, mm -hmm. why they were able to work and why they are able to move is because Anthony did have the key to Atena's heart which is you know very aw but it is also very striking how it's used in the movie because you know mm -hmm. I, I'm here explaining it but it's not like they explain it in the show or they it's not like they explain it on screen it's like this means this yeah and i feel that works in the film's advantage that sort of you know you can watch this as sort of you know a a surreal strange sort of collection of sort of oh japan sort of images one after the other but I also feel that you can read it as this sort of, you know, not only a text about sort of female empowerment, but also, you know, female sexuality and sort of obviously the patriarchy and obviously all the themes that appear in the original series. And I, and I feel I'm sort of struggling to think of another of another series with the exception, the obvious exception of Evangelion that does that. And it's sort of like, you know, it, this film can be read on sort of multiple levels. It's not just, okay, here is a car chase with hundreds of cars and this sort of Mad Max castle thing. It is, okay, this is about escaping, you know, the, not only sort of, you know, a homophobic sort of sense of society that wants you to go, oh, no, 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 no you're playing the roles of a prince and princess, but obviously you have got to be, you know, the hyper-masculine prince and the, the sort of the hyper-feminine princess. But also, you know, you, you can read this film sort of on, on, on sort of multi multiple levels, which I feel sort of is, is a good mark of any sort of film, but particularly in animation where you can be sort of more free in terms of what you're showing on screen and sort of, you know, it's more, even more subtextual than you would be in sort of a live action element. Yeah, and it's, oh go goodness, my train of thought lost right when I was going to talk, but <laughs> Sorry. it's okay, but it's, oh, God, doggone it. But it's certainly something that is up for interpretation. I mean, th what I have, it sounds like I, you know, clearly laid everything out and this is what it means. But there are other interpretations you can make. And you can just tell me to get stuffed if you'd like <laughs> on mm. my interpretation. Because, uh, I mean, I, obviously I am not the audience, I main audience. That is, they are trying to communicate. So I am just... It feels like I'm kind of talking to it in an academic standpoint, although I, you know, there is very real emotions that you can get from, you know, looking at this relationship and 
you know, getting the intimate points where it's just where you can relate, like being messy and like having to accept another person and having another person essentially see you naked, like what you've done, who you are, your mistakes and how, and then, and also having to accept there are things that are against, you know, what you believed or what you've taught to believe because like Utena is very weirded out by how sexual Anthe is, but that is a part that she has to accept from her mm. and, and they do, and that's, you know, one of the lovely things about this. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, this is like, I I would say this is one of the great sort of un sort of because this is a film I don't hear in comparisons sort of obviously the film I I feel it it, it 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 can only sort of have comparison to which is obviously End of Evangelion, which is another big budget sort of surrealist approach to a. A, a sort of a, a long a, a sort of series that obviously does cover those cover that but sort of to a lesser degree particularly obviously in the case of Evangelion where it was running out of budget um, but I, but I feel that sort of you know this film does not get talked about um, except obviously outside the spheres we've already indicated it will probably be talked about um, and I feel that's a shame because this is this is this film still stands up twenty one years on a sort of a really damn good bit of anime. Of anime. It's a very good film. It still looks very visually fresh. Obviously, the visual style is is the epitome of, of sort of nineties in terms of the character design. But sort of, it looks very fresh. It's still a very fresh film. It still has obviously much to say. Um, in terms of obviously, it's uh, the multiple readings you can have of this film, but I I feel that sort of this film deserves its time in the sun again. Uh, yes, very much so, and especially there are good animation bits, but it also wasn't as done with as big of a budget. Um, it's JC staff who are one of the mid-level ones, um, hmm. but they they sometimes stretch and do things that are outside of their uh, comfort zone which um, and there there are some things where it where they can make up for it by design which is you know this movie has in spades and then they can focus on their centerpiece animation stuff which they do a lot of um, and there's also another series where the people of JC staff wanted to make another Utena without Ikuhara um, that's called Melody of Oblivion that should be maybe checked out the problem is they kind of do Utena with a male gaze so that might not be everybody's cup of tea but there are some very interesting things that it does like Utena and the movie but um, cycling back to the movie yeah it is very beautiful very um, evocative very it's, yeah. it's really good and it's like it's age doesn't mess with its quality there are some things where oh the CG is bad or I mean it's it does have occasional stiffness but um, it's designed more than makes up to, for it the artistic quality of the animation is wonderful and it's it's beautiful when it needs the scenes that it really needs to like when um Utena is saying goodbye and acknowledging that she needs to be over this part of Toga and realize he died, he's gone. Um, and uh, so he is. she is on this other plate glass or where Toga is drowning. And there, it's just beautiful stuff like that that gets in the movie and it's a wonderful little movie and it's my favorite uh, bit of Ikuhara. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It is it is just a damn good film. And and frankly, um even if you're interested in sort of shoujo and sort of works like Utena a sort of, you know, a passing interest, um, I still think you should see this film because it's just it is it is it's just damn pretty. And it's okay and it's obviously particularly if you are approaching this film in sort of I would say almost a sort of similar circumstance to Utena to Utena and Anthe and sort of you know, you're not quite sure where your place in the world is. I, I feel this film is sort of almost quite re quite reassuring, would you say? 
Uh, yes, so, it is yeah. uh, very positive, and it's, you know, you can find your happiness. You can hmm. go and take it, and it's going to be hard. And um, one of the best parts of the ending is where <laughs> suddenly all of the uh, student council shows up on another car, and they help out the uh, characters. Um, they help out Utena and Anthe. Um, so it's implies that, you know, you also need some help with, from some friends, even though Kyochi is in there, who is an abusive fuck from the series, but um, uh, he's on the car too. But, other, but it is a very powerful scene that where, you know, support from friends and people accepting you also is sometimes needed and it's and it is very helpful too so um you know i keep i keep binding things because the movie is so dense that it's just like i every time i watch it it's like oh yeah that was in here too and that's so it is a very rewarding movie that where you will keep finding things and it is um a really excellent expression Hmm. Any final thoughts? I think I kind of just made them. It's, yep. um, you really should check it out. Um, obviously, not watching the series didn't make it bother, but I would definitely recommend watching the series first. It's, um, it's you know, thir 36 episodes or so. Um, and it's, you kind of have to. Um, let it build a little bit because it does do the um, this is a typical fairy tale action show with dueling and you know, but you have to let it work its magic but I would recommend watching the series but um, obviously you watch the movie just fine without it I mean there's some subtext you're missing but um, you know you can watch the movie hmm. yeah um, so that was, uh, Adolescence of Uh, so this format basically now we will do is, essentially is, is back and forth between the two of us. Um, obviously if and where we have guests, obviously we'll outline the uh, format, um, then. So, uh, Joe, what do we have for next time? Uh, next time we are going to watch, uh, Mamoru Oshii's... I wouldn't say forgotten, but people sure don't talk about it. Uh, the Sky Crawlers, where he goes uh, French New Wave and uh, absolutely nothing that apparently the audience wanted from him. And then they sold it with a uh, Top Gun trailer. But we'll get to all of this next time. <laughs> See you next time.